to uh, everybody. My name is Ludwig Ampers. I'm uh, a member of our uh, EcoHealth group, and I would like to welcome you all, um, ITM staff, of course, our students, our alumni, uh, and any guests who have uh, joined us today for this uh, third seminar that we are organizing, a webinar that we are uh, organizing uh, around the theme of uh, EcoHealth. So uh, maybe a few words about our EcoHealth group. It's an interdepartmental group uh, at ITM. So it's um, composed of people who are working for the people in the um, Department of Public Health for the, or on the pathogens for the biomedical department and for the uh, patients for the uh, clinical department. And that's where I'm working in as well. So we, um, in this group, we recognize the need to move towards more comprehensive systemic approaches to understanding and improving health. So I think it's um, clear also from the recent reality that indeed health is something that we should approach uh, in a comprehensive way. Think about our COVID, or our, our think about the COVID uh, pandemic, the zoonosis that has uh, struck and is keeping on um, disturbing the whole world population and economy and of course affecting our health and the economy and vice versa because one thing enforces the other and it's almost becoming a vicious circle so it's more relevant than ever. In this uh, seminar series, we invite speakers that will introduce and discuss ecosystem concepts and approaches to health in relation to the global challenges we are facing today. And um, in this first series of uh, seminars in, uh, during 2020, we discuss a bit of the why we are focusing on eco-health in the Institute of Tropical Medicine. The second series of seminars, uh, which we have uh, planned for in 2021, will focus more on how we can um, do our little bit on the uh, climate change uh, as one of the elements of eco-health. Let me share my screen and go to just one slide. I hope this is uh, visible. Um, Today we have invited Professor Maria Nilsson and we are very, very glad that she can join because uh, petite histoire, but not uh, unimportantly, um, it was almost not possible to contact her because she was in the midst of a real storm in Sweden where she is based. Um, and. Uh, an exceptional uh, hard storm, which made the electricity being cut for quite some hours. But fortunately, everything uh, was in order by the time that we um, wanted to start the uh, the uh, seminar. So um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Professor Nilsson is um, based in Umeå University in Sweden, as I said already, and her main interest is adaptation research, risk and health communication and knowledge translation in the knowledge area, climate change and global health. Um, a mouthful of words, but that's what she's going to explain us um, in, a in a comprehensible way, I'm sure, uh, during the coming half an hour. She was the integrating editor for health in the 2015 Lancet Commission Health and Climate Change Policy Responses to Protect Public Health. Again, a mouthful of words. Uh, they produced an um, important um, uh, report um, that was uh, published in 2019. And the subtitle of that report to me is very, very uh, appealing. Subtitle reads, ensuring that the health of a child born today is not defined by a changing climate. Um, and that reminds me of what we've done in our working group on uh, sustainable development a couple of years ago, I think more than five years already, where we uh, had maybe some people remember uh, pictures of our children and for some people, grandchildren, uh, pictures in the corridor and uh, showing this are the people we are 
doing it for that we have this uh, working group on sustainable development and indeed that's what it is about sustainable development and trying to uh, work on the changing climate to make sure that the planet that we are living on is kept in good health so to say for the coming generations not only is she active uh, for this uh, Lancet uh, Commission, but she's also working for on a European uh, level where she is a member of the European Ac Academy Science Advisory Council, uh, part of a working group on climate change and health that focused on discussing risks in Europe, particularly in the near future and the opportunities for adaptation and mitigation. And when this would not be enough yet, um, Professor Nielsen is also active, hands-on, I would say, on the ground. She leads a, leads a project, uh, projects more than one in low to high income countries. And to give an example, in Indonesia, she was uh, involved in a project on dengue risk communication in a local community, understanding knowledge, attitudes, and practice to improve action. And on the other hand, high income countries, she is uh, involved in five European high income countries in a project called HOPE, um, where it's also uh, looking at um, the, to reduce the climate footprint from private consumption and how existing policies affect the possibility. Uh, that possibility was studied in that HOPE uh, project. So both on a theoretical level, but also on a practical level. So we are delighted to have such a specialist in our in our um, um, seminars and uh, having found her willing to give us the webinar for the coming half an hour, because that's um, how it is organized. So we go ahead, we're going to continue with the uh, questions and answers. That's going to be led by Claudia. Um, so you are invited to write down your questions, write down the, uh, your remarks in the chat box, and that's going to be um, then summarized, or Claudia is going to do her level best to summarize it and um, moderate the discussion after the uh, presentation of Professor Nielsen. Uh, okay, I think with this, I've come to the end of the uh, quite long introduction. Um, we are going to try to, to get it organized smoothly. Um, maybe we are, or at least the ITM people who joined the colloquium last week are a bit spoiled uh, because that was organized, of course, by a professional organization. We are doing our level best and our IT person, Eve, is uh, behind the screens to make sure everything uh, um, is technically well organized. So, uh, Professor Nielsen, I would like to invite you to take the floor and please uh, give uh, present us your talk for um, the coming half an hour. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just share my screen with you. Just uh, like uh, Ludwig introduced, we really face many ch challenges today. And climate change is one of the survey events together with uh, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, deforestation, so many other serious, serious challenges. And on this slide, we see uh, the IPCC's, from the IPCC's report, the representative uh, concentration pathways. And this is scenarios that describes the different reactories for CO2 emissions and the resulting atmospheric concentration from 2000 to 2100. And they encompass a range of uh, pos possible policy, uh, climate policy outcomes from the 21st century. And according to all scenarios, it is likely that we will exceed 1.5 degrees increase by the end of this century relative to 1850. And the changing climate affects the conditions for human health and the basic requirements for maintaining good health, like clean air, clean water, sufficient food, adequate shelter. And in the last decades, knowledge of the risks has increased on how climate change will impact health. And uh, it's already causing disease and premature death. And the effects 
has proven to be far more serious than we previously have understood. Mm. Sorry. Uh, climate change impacts human health negatively in very many ways, and you can see some of those on this slide. Uh, direct effects from more frequent and extreme weather, just like storms, drought, uh, flooding, heat waves, causing increased death, injuries, mental health impacts, disorders, some infectious diseases, and large-scale displacement of people. And the rising temperature increases heat-related death and heat stress, and particularly in urban centers with the so-called urban heat island effect. And there are indirect effects from water quality, air pollution, land use change, and ecological change. And there may be increased risk of food poisoning as well, and increased prevalence of malnutrition due to reduction in crop yields. Um, there will be also be changes in the incidence in, in the distribution of some vector-borne diseases like dengue, and then particularly at the edges of the distribution. And also increasing incidence of emerging infections among both livestock and humans. And climate change will affect everybody, but some population groups uh, are more vulnerable than others, and impacts of climate change intersect with other societal changes. For example, population aging and urbanization. Um, there will be differing vulnerabilities at, in different locations, different parts of the world. And the Arctic, uh, Africa, and the small islands are especially at risk and affected by climate change. Africa is one of the most vulnerable uh, continents to climate variability and change because of multiple existing stresses uh, and low adaptive capacity. Climate change impacts also mental health, and this is an under-research area. The Lancet Countdown on Climate Change and Health that was published in 2017 emphasized the need for more evidence on, in this area and called mental health impacts, the unseen effects of climate change on human health. And it has not been given priority. Uh, there are challenges with the specific attribution, of course, of mental health outcomes to climate change. And all this together makes that the evidence base is uh, limited. But it's large enough to conclude that the risk of effects are, is increasing. And the emerging literature deals with different climate change related mental health outcomes derived directly from impacts of extreme events, such as heat waves, drought, wildfires, floods and storms again, and more indirectly related to rising temperatures and sea levels. Uh, Climate change is also related to both acute and chronic mental health impacts in a number of ways, covering a range from very light to very severe conditions. Due to uh, the limitations we have in time, I will only give a few examples. After disaster, acute effects, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance abuse all tend to increase. The risk of uh, psychological trauma or shock from injury and damage or loss of home, land or other property is significant in the aftermath of disasters. And while acute effects tend to, uh, from shock and trauma tend to fade away uh, when people get a feeling of security when it's re-established and when they feel that life returns to more normal condition, the post-traumatic stress disorder may manifest as a chronic disorder. And um, other chronic impacts reported includes a persistent sense of loss, for example, after having lost person in important places in an extreme event. Amongst those having been exposed to severe disasters, uh, the likelihood 
of committing suicide has also been reported higher. People with pre-existing mental health problems may also be disproportionately affected. Um, there are also increased risk from heat for patients in, with mental health disorders. Uh, vulnerable individuals may be susceptible to relatively small changes in climatic conditions. And there is also a perception of a slow, gradual impact by, by climate change on human and ecological systems that may negatively impact mental health and inner well-being. The area requires more research, but also on how climate change affects children, children's mental health and well-being. However, it is reported that uh, effects from uh, extreme weather events may affect children's um, psychological well-being uh, with the risk of uh, developing different mental health consequences such as this depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, phobias, but also sleep and attachment disorders. The magnitude of the health effects depends on the nature of the hazard, exposure to the hazard and the individual vulnerability. And as already said, there are, the, those who are already vulnerable may be susceptible to relatively small changes in climatic conditions. Individuals may be vulnerable because of particular sensitivity or because of inadequate operation of health and social systems or other infrastructure. Among those most vulnerable are the elderly, people with pre-existing medical conditions, infants and children, pregnant women, outdoor workers, migrants and other marginalized groups, and the poor with less means to adapt. I will give a few concrete examples of the vulnerabilities. Heat waves and cold spells are associated with increases in premature mortality and morbidity. The main effects are on cardiovascular, respiratory and cerebrovascular disease. Among groups particularly susceptible uh, to heat are, as said, the elderly, infants and young children, and then those with the pre-existing health problems and those in hospitals, nursing homes or who are bedridden. Uh, for the pregnant women, unusually high temperatures expect exposure affects a range of birth outcomes, including length of uh, gestation, birth weight, um, stillbirth, and neonatal stress. And then city dwellers are exposed to higher heat stress because of the urban heat island, increasing the vulnerabilities. So for people already with diseases, urban heat island effect can be really serious and add on to the, the vulnerability they already have. The urban heat island effect means that densely populated areas are warmer than the surrounding area. And the effect arises from the physical structure uh, of the built environment and also in the use of build, different building materials that store heat during the day and emit heat during the night. The main health effects of flooding are cardiovascular events, injuries, infections, um, exposure to chemical hazards and mental health consequences. And the associated disruption of services, including health services, um, safe drinking water, sanitation, and transport may also increase vulnerabilities. The greater susceptibility of the elderly can be explained by their lower physiological reserve capacity, a slower metabolism, and more slowly uh, responding immune system. The cardiovascular and central nervous system may be particularly at risk. And vulnerability in the elderly may also be related both to poor physical health and uh, medication um, and to uh, an underestimation of heat related uh, health risks. And then when we turn to uh, vulnerabilities, different vulnerabilities, 
we have on this slide we have um, uh, also different types of vulnerabilities. The climate change induced migration is the first one that I will speak about. Uh, it occurs through different pathways, uh, such as population displacement due to extreme weather events, but also sea level rise and consequences of climate change, lack of water supply in hot climate, repeated severe floods and damage or loss uh, of land and property are other examples. The migration can be temporary or permanent, of course, and uh, there are scientific challenges in understanding this. We need more research on this and the scientific challenges uh, depends on the causes, the dynamics and magnitude of the problem, of course. The understanding of the role of climate change may be hampered by the complexity uh, of uh, projections and also in rightly, correctly uh, estimating population increase and population movement. Estimations of how many people may need to migrate, they differ, but uh, in the Lancet Countdown report, uh, it was estimated that over 1 billion people will have to migrate within the next 90 years unless actions are undertaken uh, to prevent this from the polar ice from melting. So we have a huge, a huge challenge in this way too. And only looking at Sahel, the worst affected region probably in, regarding this, it is estimated that hundreds of millions of people may have to um, migrate. And they will probably have to migrate before the end of this century. And the challenges will have to be uh, countered by strengthening of um, the health system to make them climate resilient and migrant inclusive. And then also we have lots of children in the world, about 2.3 children, billion children in the world that lives also in many resource poor settings, many of them does in low and middle income countries. And poverty exacerbates vulnerability. And ahead of them, the children will have a lifetime of exposure to potential harms. Uh, children have been considered uh, more vulnerable of climate change for many reasons. Their behavior uh, exposes uh, them to risks. Uh, they also, their bodies respond to differently to exposures. Uh, they are lacking control of the environment in which they live. And they also depend on care and protection from adults. And through adolescence and into adulthood, adulthood, a child born today is breathing toxic air driven by fossil fuel, uh, which may be worsened also by um, increasing temperatures. And this is especially damaging to young people, of course, um, as their lungs are still developing. So polluted air takes a great toll contributed to uh, um, reduce lung function, worsening asthma, and over time increasing the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Any action on climate change um, confronts serious ethical uh, issues of fairness and responsibility across individuals, nations, and generations. And many of those vulnerable countries and people are those who have emitted the least historically and those whose emissions levels continue to be relatively low. And this appears to be seriously unfair and casts a notable shadow over both practical and theoretical efforts to secure global cooperation. And then we also have the current emissions and they have 
profoundly into generational effects. The emissions of carbon dioxide typically persist in the atmosphere for a long time, contributing to negative climate impacts for centuries or even millennia, according to the IPCC. Already vulnerable groups are affected by the effects of climate change as an extra burden in an already exposed situation. And uh, I also would like to tell you a little bit about the Lancet countdown work. Um, as you know, the medical journal, the Lancet is uh, the oldest English medical journal and arguably among the most influential medical journals in the world. Um, it has worked to better understand the links between health and climate change for a long time, for almost three decades. And in 2015, the Lancet Countdown conclude, concluded, uh, sorry, the Lancet Commission report concluded that anthropogenic climate change threatens to undermine the past 50 years of gains in public health and that tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. So each year since 2015, the Lancet has published the Lancet Countdown uh, annual report. And this report tracks uh, the world as it moves from climate change as a threat to human health to the response to climate change um, as an opportunity for human health. And the collaboration draws on expertise from uh, many institutions. On this slide, you can see the different uh, publications since 2015 with the Lancet first commission report. And then from 2016, uh, a yearly publication in Lancet countdown following indicators. The collaboration draws uh, on uh, institutions in many countries, um, in 35 leading academic institutions and also UN institutions and also um, different, we have actually increased the number of institutes uh, over the years we worked with the Lancet Countdown. Uh, it includes about 120 climate scientists and geographers, mathematicians, um, physicians, uh, transport and energy experts, development experts, engineers, economists, social and politic political scientists, and also health professionals. So it's really a very diverse group of scientists working across uh, disciplines. On this slide, you can see a diagram uh, to show how the five working groups of the Lancet Countdown works together and how they relate to each other. Um, in the center, we have the health impacts of climate change in working group one. And below, we have the response to the health impacts of climate change in the form of health adaptation in a working group number two. And then mitigations, mitigation actions and health co-benefits in working group three. And so surrounding all of those, we have the economic and political context. And those are the working group four and five. On this slide, uh, you can see many indicators. We have different sections, uh, one working group working with one section each. And in the 2019 report, we tracked 41 indicators. They are listed here, and of course you can't read them all, but we, every year we try to improve and make the indicator work better. Uh, and on this slide, you see two yellow mark new indicators for the year. Uh, it includes uh, this indicator 3.2, for example, that we see here, it includes a really a huge effort. Uh, it includes um, data on household fuel use for cooking, which represents an enormous effort by the WHO to compile household um, surveys conducted at the national and local level. 
And this complements the existing data on the proportion of zero emission energy consumed uh, in the residential sector model by the International Energy Agency. And the geographical co coverage of the number of indicators uh, has also improved, including much larger co country participation in service that inform adaptation planning and assessment. Um, climate information services for health and detection, preparedness uh, and response to health emergencies. There were six new indicators added to the 2019 report. Um, we have some key messages. And here you can see one. And Lucas uh, Ludwig, I think, introduced that also from the beginning. The life of every child born today will be profoundly affected by climate change. We need to think long term and also need to focus on the children. And that was very much what we did in the last report in 2019. Here uh, you can see green, uh, see some, um, um, I'm sorry, need to move some uh, pathways that we say if we continue. Um, a business as usual scenario. So this is from the 2019 report. Global yield potential for all uh, major crops tracked since 1960 threatens food production and food security, with infants often worst affected by the potentially permanent effects of undernutrition. Nine of the 10 most suitable years for the transmission of dengue on record occurring since 2000. And those indicators you see here were uh, indicators that we highlighted also in our communication when the, mission, when, the com when the countdown report was published. Since an early 1980 baseline, the number of days suitable for Vibrio a pathogen uh, responsible for part of the burden of diarrheal disease has um, doubled in global suitability for coastal Vibrio. Um, cholera has increased by 9.9. .9. And global deaths attributable to ambient PM remain at 2.9 billion in 2016. 77 of countries experienced an increase in daily population exposure to wildfire also. So to conclude, without accelerated intervention, this new era will come to define the health of people at every stage of their lives. So therefore we say that it's important to understand progress and also to continue to act. Thank you for listening. And you can find more information at our website or the Lancet Countdown and also follow on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Nielsen, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, of course, a subject that we could elaborate for much longer, but uh, a, a very interesting introduction for uh, the questions we have. So uh, let's start with your very last point about action, right? Uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic is one example of a global, um, of, a, of a, 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 pro a problem of a global scale, both uh, in terms of reach and uh, uh, vulnerability for different populations uh, all over the world. Uh, what do you think are the most important lessons that the uh, climate change adaptation and people advocating for this subject they can learn from the current situation we are living? Well, of course, we can see that the world has united in many senses. And national governments have also been prepared to put up lots of resources to combat this acute challenge. And um, I think that is also something that is positive, that we can see that they actually are prepared if they understand also uh, the necessity to do so. And I, of course, would like them to also challenge, uh, take on this challenge and uh, make sure that we have resources 
to um, really see that we introduce strong adaptation efforts, that we secure health systems. Because also a concern of mine is that now when the world is challenged with COVID, um, we also we don't need also this uh, the health impacts from climate change. Of course, uh, it's really it's really a difficult time in many senses. But uh, I I stay positive in the sense that I've seen we've seen the world combating and being prepared to combat a, a global challenge like this. In the same line of thought, uh, we can see, for example, that uh, we can foresee that some of the resources that were initially uh, destined for uh, climate um, change adaptation can be now invested into recovery and actually facing all the COVID-19 consequences. What, can, what do you think uh, we as researchers and academics can do to prevent that from happening, a diversion of funding that uh, really prevents us from doing what we have to do. Mm. No, it's a, that is a big challenge. I think uh, we need to we need to um, work together. Um, I know that you work together in in uh, ITM with others. Um, we also at the university have decided to have a university wide network that where we collaborate together with all disciplines cross-disciplinary uh, and i think uh, instead of di getting diverse we need to really work together instead and uh, make sure that we have positive examples to policymakers and also sensitizing uh, the public so it, i think it's very much about how we unite and how we work, work transdisciplinary and also how we can uh, communicate with the public Uh, again, like in that in that context, uh, um, policymakers uh, in many countries have been very slow to integrate the evidence that has come from uh, climate change research into actual policies. Why do you think is that, and how we, can we address such a, a slow uptake of recommendations? The low uptake of what? I of recommendations derived from uh, climate change research. Yeah, I think we have a we have a responsibility, of course, as researchers, to make sure that we communicate our funding findings in this area, and uh, working in public health, we I think we have a very strong responsibility to do so. Um, we work with um, factors that actually, uh, are, I I would say we are may, probably the 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 medical within the medical faculty public health is the discipline closest to politics in the sense that we also they what they do matters for public health so we need to uh, i think we really need to make sure that our findings are reported to policymakers as a as such a good um, and wide uh, range as possible I'm not, I couldn't hear you probably <laughs> completely well. So if I didn't answer your question, please repeat it. It is, it is. You, you did okay. address it indeed. Okay. Uh, and I guess a part of the question is also related of how can we better communicate uh, with uh, the general public and the policymakers because all these studies and this evidence is available, but for to, to some extent does not uh, reach um, uh, does not translate into actual policy uh, as effectively as we expect. Mm. So in that regard as well, uh, what do you think are the most understudied under aspects of climate health adaptation that are necessary to influence uh, policymaking at this stage? There are certain gaps and one of those I mentioned during the presentation with mental health aspects. Um, we we are we have a rather strong research basis when it comes to physical health, but when it comes to mental health impacts, it needs to be built stronger. And also, we need to understand how uh, those vulnerable groups of, of people also can be supported, treated uh, in a better way. Um, so um, this is a very I think it's a very important field to to uh, get stronger and to have more research in. And also, of course, we would need more research funding to be able to do that, because as mentioned, there are many challenges of attribution there. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have some questions regarding uh, references. Which countries do you think provide a good path for other countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, public policy and adaptation and change uptake of evidence in the last few years? I would love to say Sweden, <laughs> but um, we have many weaknesses as well. Um, I don't think there is um, many good countries yet. I think all countries need to step up. Uh, and also we uh, as researchers, as I said, if we feed our research findings into policy and practice, it may be so that that happens, but it's really, really vital that um, we have a, a, a braver politicians also. Uh, braver po politicians that are prepared to listen to researchers. Uh, many doesn't today. And I would like to see that happen, of course. So we need to communicate our findings and, and have the energy to do that over and over again. Um, come back and uh, try to reshape our messages. Um, easy to understand. Uh, be active in the uh, public sphere. Uh, I guess another important scenario to introduce these messages is in education scenarios. Uh, what do you think we as uh, people, health scientists uh, working in academic agendas uh, can do? Uh, what, what do you think we, we, that is what our work can be? How can it be impacted by these messages and how can we translate these into curriculum and, and, and uh, academic action? I think we are specialists in giving good courses. So uh, this is a field where we should give good courses and also make sure that they are, of course, based on, on the science, but also make them interactive. Um, try to really engage different types of students, depending on where we lecture, of course, what students we teach. But uh, we should give really good courses on climate change and also with the health impacts as one part of that. Uh, an incoming question from our uh, uh, audience is, a, a lot of the evidence is on links between climate change and health risks. Are there also convincing studies on links between actions and improved health? Actions. Yeah, between actions and improved health. I guess, uh, I'm, I guess uh, the, the person is talking about advocacy actions or interventions yeah. and improved health. There, there, are, there, is a, there is some research on mental well-being on action. And we also have that from other fields. Uh, when, when you have a concern that is huge, and also in this sense with, the, as I said, the slow gradual impact of, and the concern over that from, from uh, people, uh, there we have some, some research that supported, supports that um, action is a good thing to do. It's a coping strategy. And there is also some research that I looked into young people and found that emotional coping strategies, like um, that they work the best for young people, where they could say that they really, um, they, they put the hope into politicians, into researchers, and also connected to hope that they felt that if they act, we trust them, and then we can actually think this is good. So it's both about action as a coping strategy, but then also putting place, your hope in place of, of um, the, the decision makers and the researchers. Well, that seems a very good introduction for our next question, which is, um, what do, would you say if a young person tells you we are not going to, I'm not going to have children because I don't want to add further uh, carbon print. No. What would be your reaction? And that also uh, some young, young colleagues that says so. Um, I, I think that uh, I, would, I would talk about what I do myself and that I engage in this area because I find it important. And by, act, by believing in action and believing in uh, also uh, introducing science to decision makers, uh, we can make a change. So I believe in that. And, and by doing that, I still think that we should, 
we should have a chance to have a good life, also including families and, and children in the future. But I can certainly understand um, young people who, who think like this, because it is, I mean, we need to face climate change. We need to look climate change in the eyes and be brave enough to do that, but uh, then act. So see the seriousness, see the, the risks we have, face the risks that are there, but then act. Um, and by that also keeping hope and, and feeling that we do what we can and also believing in the future. But uh, of course we need to acknowledge the, both the concern, the seriousness and the risks. In terms of action, uh, we have here a young medical doctor who is interested in the field of planetary health and epidemiology. And she's asking your, or he is asking your advice about further education uh, that you can recommend uh, on, on, on these two aspects, planetary health and epidemiology. And uh, how do you think you can find possible fields to work? Uh, any ideas? Yeah. Well, there are many universities now that um, offer courses on climate change and health and planetary health as well. So it's just about looking into universities uh, and seeing now, now also quite many courses will be offered online. So I think that is a good, good thing for, for many people being able to take those courses without traveling as well. And what was your second question? Uh, the last part of the question. How do you think you can find possi possible fields to work? Uh, yeah. Possible fields to work. Um, yeah. It's a wide question, but um, <laughs> it's a very wide question. I think that uh, today, if one is a medical doctor, one is a role model also working in health in the health sector. So by also engaging in uh, climate change, um, there are many organizations today in the world working with medical doctors. Uh, as part of this. So I think by engaging there, one has a framework. And uh, also if one wants to specify, spe be um, to have a more specific work in uh, climate change and health, there are many uh, global international NGOs to work with and support. So one can of course decide to work voluntarily for a while. And maybe if there's a door opening and also go into to, um, professional work. But there are many, I think there are many opportunities opening today within um, the NGOs, but also within uh, universities in the health sector. For example, you may know that uh, the National Health Service in England has decided to um, really put sustainability high and has um, also um, employed the former Lancet uh, countdown director executive director to lead that work. So they are really stepping up to wanting to become um, a carbon free organization, natural organization. And that is talking about your earlier question about role models and, and countries, what they do, that is a really good example. So looking into what is already there, there are many good examples where a medical doctor can work with climate change and health. What is part of the, the career he's, or she's already having, but also engaging fully. Uh, we have uh, two questions uh, focused on your relationship and your experience with policymakers uh, in the last years. Uh, one of them is, uh, do you have the impression that politicians listen more to scientists since the corona outbreak? Do you think that could be the case? Um, I no, I wouldn't say yes, no, I wouldn't. They listen. Oh, well, this is difficult to talk about because I know that you will re record this and send this also. But of course, I would be happy to say yes, but I can't really say that. They have perceived this acute uh, challenge and put lots of resources into it. But uh, climate change um, will probably be the thing that will impact health more in the medium and long term. And we haven't seen that they have been prepared to put resources into that. So to the acute effects, yes, but I'm not sure if that would also come into uh, resources for climate change and health, for example. 
Uh, so then the next question is, do you, do you have any ideas uh, about effective tactics that can help nudge reluctant policymakers into action? One has to be wise and select the right uh, study and the re most important results for the right politician. And also make sure that is, um, the messages are clear, of course. Um, what I do is that I, I try to keep a dialogue with as many policymakers as possible and just presenting results. And if they, if they understand that you um, are there, that you can lecture, that you can also give support, I, my perception is that the uh, willingness to listen increases. So it's very much about giving, putting some time into it. It needs time and also some, some good contacts need to be built. And also to make sure that if there are, um, if there are any um, advisory boards that the government uh, listens to, make sure that there are people on climate and health in those when we talk about the health sector. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, uh, what do you think about the role of energy sector, the energy sector in support of health sector in climate change mitigation and prevention? What I think about the energy sector in supporting, yes. did you say that? Yeah. Um, well, the en I mean, the energy sector is huge. Uh, it's a difficult question to answer to. We would need to split it up. But I would like, of course, to see that uh, the energy sector will be fossil free. Um, that would be the best support. Okay, we have uh, several questions about uh, research on uh, future research on climate adaptation. You mentioned already areas of uh, mental health. Any other thoughts on this area? I'm not sure. The sound isn't that good. So can you please repeat the question? So uh, we have several questions about uh, the future of uh, research in climate adaptation. Uh, and the, um, several um, participants are asking for your ideas on how, where should we focus on. Uh, you mentioned mental health before, mm -hmm. and uh, we also have uh, some thoughts from you about uh, chronic uh, conditions. Any other ideas? Well, uh, talking about adaptation, we need warning systems. I mean, for, for, for example, for dengue, um, as my, I have been active in myself. Uh, in Indonesia, we are now currently working on introducing an early warning system for dengue fever. And uh, that also includes working together with the, the, the um, general public so that they know what to do when a warning comes. Uh, we need warning early warning system for heat so that people know what to do when we have a heat wave that will actually be a threat to a vulnerable population as the elderly. So in elderly homes, people know what to do when heat, a heat wave starts. So we need early warning system with good guidelines and with good corporations with the ones who are going to act upon a warning. So those also knows what to do. Okay, Professor Nielsen, thank you very much for all your answers. Uh, I don't see uh, any more questions coming from the audience. Oh, yes, one more. Are we at the point of evaluation, evaluating climate uh, adaptation policies and learning from these evaluations? Uh, if so, could you comment on any relevant, especially informing evaluations or assessments? Again, this is on climate adaptation. Yeah, well, we have uh, several, several um, systems for evaluating adaptation. Uh, maybe I could do so that I send to you some uh, on email afterwards a few uh, some information on that so you can share with the participants also. Uh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, for sure we can do it. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, okay, one more question here. Uh, so soon today elections in the U.S. <laughs> um, and. Uh, 
So far, the Trump administration has done everything they can to deny science and denigrate scientists when it comes to climate change. Uh, how could uh, a potential, uh, the, how could the results of this election potentially impact efforts done in, in, in this field? Yeah, well, what we've seen so far during the four years with the Trump administration, it's not an administration that support uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. That's a, they stepped out of the Paris Agreement. So anything but that uh, would be better for climate, of course. And I, I actually am quite concerned about the election. So without having to say it, I, I you understand what I would put my vote on if I was an American. Yes, so I think it's a, it's a shared concern. Mm. Uh, again, Professor Nielsen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to uh, give the floor back to Ludwig uh, to conclude this uh, very interesting conversation. Thanks for your time and your input. Thank you. So um, in turn, I want to thank uh, Professor Nielsen a lot for the talk that she's given and especially for all the answers that you've given for the questions who kept on coming. It was almost like an axiom that you had to uh, fulfill. Um, but the fact that there were so many questions means that indeed you touched on um, real uh, interesting, not only interesting, but important issues and that people feel uh, engaged and hopefully involved also with what we have discussed uh, this afternoon. What I remember but just just a small thing is that you um that you insist on hope um and yeah indeed mental health as a doctor i'm i'm dealing with it uh, on a daily basis and definitely now in this uh, crisis sometimes difficult to to measure sometimes it's obvious depression and so on sometimes it's just difficult to measure and that the fact that you insist on it that we need to study and need more rev um, evidence more research on this I think is very important, but not easy to, to do. But, um, well, one of the most important things is to, uh, to, uh, to raise hope also for the, the future and uh, for the children um, that are living now and that, that are to come. Because indeed, if we decide that this planet is not worth anymore, um, be, um, populated by children, then I think we are definitely on the wrong, on the wrong way. What I um, still um, want to do now is to uh, quickly share with you what we um, have for the future. Um, there is, on the 7th of December, we have the next seminar and uh, we have invited Dr. Stanley Blue of the Lancaster University from the United Kingdom. And he's going to talk on flexibility and sustainable practices. That's a bit a um, generic title, I would say. But I've understood that he is actually an expert in energy and in fossil fuels and how to uh, yeah, influence this uh, important uh, yeah, uh, stakeholder, so to say, in the whole debate uh, and um, move this Tinkered, so to say, in the right direction to more sustainable practices. And then for next year, we have already Meryl Singer from the University of Connecticut, who's going to talk on syndemics, and uh, Professor Gert Verschragen, much more close by, from the University of Antwerp, who's going to give us a talk on interdisciplinarity. So with this, um, we've come to an end of uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, once more, I would like to thank our distinguished guest who has given us a talk on the important work she's doing both in the theory of uh, defining, for instance, these determinants, because if we don't measure, we don't know, and we need indeed uh, determinants, indicators, figures to convince the policymakers. But on the other hand, we need also practical projects like, for instance, what uh, Professor Nielsen uh, is doing or has been doing in Indonesia on the uh, effect of dengue. So it's both uh, as a researcher trying to document what, where the problem lies, but also trying to, uh, to think of practical uh, projects, practical changes of attitudes to cope with the 
uh, effects of the changing climate. And I want to thank you, the audience, for uh, being with us for the, um, um, for the past hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And we hope to see you again for the next seminar on the 7th of December. See you then.